What a great conference has been so far, eh? I've had a lot of fun. Um, so before I start, I actually want to, I know there's going to be thanks and everything in the end, but running a conference is bloody hard work. And for those who put their hand up at the beginning saying, you're here for the first time, um, for those, the, the people who have been here for the eighth time, especially to you, thank you for coming. Big round of applause for the organizers. It's just, <laughs> thanks for putting it on. Mostly purely selfishly because I've never been to South Africa before, and now I can say I have. So, um, so my name is Ben Decroy. I work for Auth0 as a developer evangelist, um, but I'm not going to talk to you about their products in this talk. I'm going to be talking to you about web application security. I come from a background of, of security. I um, started with uh, software development back in 1999 after leaving university. I started on PHP. Does anybody here hate PHP as much as I do? Yeah? So I've had a long exposure to it, and I have the right to hate it. Um, I also love it because, you know, languages, they're all the same. They all have data in, data out, um, and they all have their own peculiarities and different uh, vulnerability vectors. So when I was putting this talk together, I thought I need to try and hone down, like, web application security is a massive, massive arena. And I thought, how can I consolidate this down into um, something that's uh, accessible and, and something that, that's not going to like confuse everybody so much. So I thought, well, I'll start off with a mind map because we all love mind maps. So I thought, let's have a look at all the areas of web application security. Um, so I started building out all these little branches and arms and start getting a little bit bigger. And, and, and then I got to the point where I thought, I don't even know what I've written anymore. Um, I, I need to take a different angle. Like I can't consolidate this down. So where to start? Has anybody here not heard of, the, of OWASP? So it stands for the Open Web Application Security Project, uh, OWASP.org. And it's a great resource in terms of lots of different web application security principles and guidelines. Um, but one of the best things about them is they have a top 10 list of vulnerabilities. So the top 10 are injection attacks, cross-site scripting attacks, weak authentication, session management. You can read all those by yourselves. Um, you've probably heard a lot of them. And five of them, in fact, are things that are things you can try out yourself. So I'm going to change things up. It's not going to be so much of a, um, a slideshow talk. I'm going to do a live demo. We all know live demos can fail drastically. So I hope, really, really hope it's going to go well. Um, probably not as much as you hope it's going to go really well, because otherwise it's just going to be awkward for everybody. Um, so these five are here. I'm going to go straight into a demo. Um, we're going to have a look at different ways of attacking a system. So one thing I highly recommend uh, if you're ever, can you see that at the back OK? Yep, cool. So if you're, um, if you're ever doing any kind of uh, testing and, and application hacking and anything like that, um, don't do what I did the first time, which is to run it on your host machine. <laughs> so I've got three virtual machines. Um, I'm still a vagrant person. I haven't moved them over to Docker yet. But whatever virtualization technology you like, just create a box. That way, if you break it, you can just restart it. And you don't lose all your active production development. So this is all a bit of fun, right? So um, the, the, the five areas we're going to be looking at was injection attack, cross-site scripting, weak authentication, insecure direct object reference, and cross-site request forgery. So we'll take those uh, one step at a time. Just, and I, I want to show you an actual um, insight into what's happening behind the scenes when some of these attacks happen. So we'll have a look at an injection attack. We have here, um, now, please don't crucify me. This is a, um, a public viewable list of the usernames and passwords in my database. I highly recommend you don't do this. <laughs> You'll also notice that these are in plain text in my database. I also highly recommend you don't do that. <laughs> so we have on the left here a form, which is our standard uh, registration form. Um, you put a username and password in. You might have a password in there twice, if that's the kind of thing you want to do. Um, but for all intents and purposes, we need username and password to create an account, and we need username and password to log into an account. And behind the scenes, uh, if I logged in as, uh, let's say, Ben and the password password, uh, also, not standard is to have the password visible as you're typing it in, but for the demo purposes, I thought it might be a good idea. So if I logged in, uh, you can see in the top right-hand corner, oh, I created an account. I should be using the login for this. So we'll do the create. Now, obviously, my account exists there already, so that's not going to work. Let's go in and create Ben2. So you can see Ben2 has now been created on the right-hand side there with the password password. 
And by default, the admin flag is zero, because when somebody logs into your site the first time, you probably not want to immediately want to give them admin access. Uh, so if we have a look here, we've got the actual SQL that's being run. So we're inserting into the user table the username and password and the status of the admin flag. The username is Ben2, the password is password, and the admin flag is zero. So you can probably tell that the zero has been added in, in the back end by the script. That's not something that gets sent through from the front end. It would be really terrible if I had a hidden field in there that said admin is false. Don't do that. <laughs> but we can see the SQL that's actually being run. Now, the first thing you might do if you want to try and do some kind of SQL injection uh, is to break it. So let's put a semicolon in there and see what happens. So what you would hope in a well-written system is that you'd create a user with the username ben2 quote. Yeah? So what happens here, because I'm not using any kind of um, uh, PDO extension or any kind of link between the application and the database, uh, which can, is a, a good practice, um, you can see here that what's what happening is we're getting the two quotes next to each other. Now that's not going to work. And you can see on the side here the Ben2 quote has not been added. But we can see from this, and again, I also recommend you don't display your actual SQL on a production website. Um, but we can see here that we've got some room, some leverage to play with what SQL actually gets run against the database. So let's see what happens here. We've got the Ben2 quote, if we look at the last query above there. So I could add in there that, for example. And now if we look at the SQL that's being run, we're still not getting anything on the right-hand side because the SQL is currently invalid. But if we look at it, we're inserting into user username, password, admin, values, ben2, password, zero. That, for all intents and purposes, should work. And then there's a whole lot of cruft after it. Can anybody tell me what a, a comment marker is in SQL? Two dashes. So if I put two dashes in there, so now what we have is SQL that's creating an account with username ben2 password, but of course the username ben2 exists already. So through a process of elimination, we've now got a point here where I can create an account of ben3 with the password password and admin is zero, which then suggests that I can do that. So I've just created an account on the right-hand side here, ben4 password and admin is one which means if I jump over here, um, normally what would happen if I log in with Ben and password is we get select stuff from user where username is Ben and password is password, and we're gonna limit it to one just in case there's multiples, there shouldn't be, um, but just so we know the response is gonna be a single response. And you can see at the top there that Ben is now logged in. Um, so I have a very simple log app process, just click on the name, very usable. Um, if we logged in as admin and complex, then you can see logged in as admin, and that's up in red now, because we know that's an admin user. So we created Ben4 with a password password through SQL injection, and I'm now logged in as an admin user, having just used the standard registration form. So that's one way you could create an account in a system that doesn't do proper SQL injection attack protection. Uh, but you don't necessarily need to create yourself an account. You can probably make an assumption that there's already an admin account in the system. So let's try and hack the login form instead. So let's use the same principle. We want to log in as Ben4. We want to use uh, password, password. And we're going to limit it to one. And then we're going to put in the comment. So now when I run this, it's running select stuff from user where username is four, uh, Ben4 and password is password, limit one. So it's exactly the same query as we had before. So let's reset that so we're back to the beginning. We've only got Ben and admin. So if I log in, and let's also log out. So if I log in here and I say I want uh, where username is Ben uh, and, oops. Well, let's ignore the password because I don't actually know what the password is. I'm just gonna say an admin equals one and put in my comment there. I'm not even gonna bother with the password. So what we have here is select stuff from user where username is Ben and admin is one. Now there isn't a username with Ben and admin is one. Um, but if I do that, I'm now logged in as admin and I haven't even created an account. So SQL injection attacks basically hack your forms, send through information. The lesson from this is obviously to validate the SQL that comes in. Um, best way of validating SQL is to use existing systems platforms on top of the languages you're using um, or 
uh, ORMs that do the connectivity between your code and the application, uh, the, the database in the background. Um, but it's important to know, like a lot of us will probably never do hard low level coding in the application without a, a set of libraries or a framework on, on top. But I believe it's important to know what the underlying principles are of SQL injection attacks because it's not always going to be this form of attack that you're protecting against. And to understand what's going on in the background is going to um, allow you to potentially foresee issues that are going to be occurring. So let's move on to uh, cross-site scripting. So in a very similar way, so the, the injection attacks were ways of providing data through a form or through some kind of uh, user-provided content to a back-end system that was going to inject into a database, or it could also be injecting into any other third-party system. It might be um, that your back-end is then going to talk to an API, and through um, changing the format of the text or the data that you're providing when submitting the request, the request to the API is modified, and you could even have further reaching effects on, on other systems. Um, Cross-site scripting is more about how to modify the application itself in the front end uh, in order to perform a different action so that the action that the user thinks they're taking is not necessarily the one that they are taking. So I'll have a look at a couple of demos of exactly how that works. So to save me typing a little bit, I've just got a couple of examples down here. So if I click on this, it's going to reload the page, and it's going to add a query string in saying user equals Ben. So this is a very popular way of making somebody's life easier. They've just logged in. They've said my, my password, is, uh, my name is, my username is Ben, my password is Foo, but it's not. So it reloads the page and says uh, this is not a valid username and password combination, and I'm going to pre-populate your username just in case that was the correct one. So one way to do that would possibly be to do it through the, um, the query string. It's not a bad way of doing it. It's, it's not a good way. It's just a way. Um, so what happens if I put in something slightly more interesting? So before we have a look at the slightly more interesting, let's just have a look at what actually happened. So the last request we've got here, um, Ben got sent through in the user parameter. That's the value. So what actually happened is that that value, Ben, is just inserted into the value of the value attribute. Does that make sense? So what we're going to do now is we're going to modify what we're sending through to change that HTML in more drastic ways. So using reflection, we can actually get other information in there. So if you look at what's happening there, we're closing a, uh, an HTML tag. Then we're opening another HTML tag and going to display an image. And then right at the end, we've got span class equals quote with nothing else after that. So if I click on that, we can see why that happened. So we've just got uh, an image injected into the page just by, by virtue of having hacked it through the query string. And if we look at what happened down here, this is where the value tag opened. And the part in red is the bit that was inserted at the back end when that response came through. And the reason we have the span class equals quote is because we've still got the closing tag of what was the value attribute of the input field that we still need to handle, otherwise we're going to break the HTML in the web page. So in order to make it still render and for there to be no, no browser errors, as an not necessarily ethical hacker, but as somebody who doesn't want you to feel like you've been hacked, probably not an ethical hacker at all, really, is it? Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to make sure the HTML doesn't break. But what I've done is I've basically closed the input tag, I've added an image in, and then I've opened a span tag, which can then be ignored, uh, and we can continue on our way. So you could probably argue that adding, adding an image in is probably not something that's really going to frustrate people. It could confuse them. Uh, it's probably not going to affect their security. So what else could we do? We could add uh, a bit more information that actually modifies the intent of the form itself. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to close the attribute, the, um, the value attribute tag, quote. I'm going to add an extra attribute into the input form, which says display none. So I'm now hiding the username input field. Then I close the label, I close the div, I close the form. So the form that I think I'm submitting to is no longer the form I'm submitting to, because now I'm going to start a new form. I'm going to submit through to evil.cto.io. Uh, this is currently running on good. There's always good and evil. It's always black and white. There are no shades of gray. But I'm going to create uh, a form now that submits to another website, and then I'm going to recreate the input form up to the point that the input form previously was generated by the server. So the resultant uh, HTML down here now is we have our div, our label, the label username, the input tag, which is hidden and then closed, then the label and the div and the form are closed. Then we start the form 
when we show the input tag and we close the input or the, the input tag finishes, we close the label and the div. So again, we've got semantically correct HTML. We're not going to get browser errors. And it looks exactly the same, he says, pointing at a screen to scroll down too far. So it looks exactly the same. We've got the same label. We've got the same form. Um, but unbeknownst to you, allegedly, you're actually going to be submitting this to a different page. So now if I log in, let me just check that I've reset this. So if I now log in, you can see that I'm directed to evil.cto collect.php and the username and password are passed through in the query string. Now that could be passed through in a form, in a post uh, request as well, rather than a, a get request. That's purely so you can see it. The effect is still the same. On evil.cto, I now have, if I refresh this, the collect text at the bottom, which is currently empty, goes up to 56 bytes. And if we look at it, we can see the username and password are now stored on a third party system after I logged into what looked like the login form on good.cto. Tier. So we're now at the point where we're collecting data off-site. But like, if this happened to you, you'd say, hang on a minute, or rather if that happened to you, you'd say, hang on a minute, why am I now on evil.cto.to and why do I have a blank screen? Something's wrong. So we don't want people to be alerted to this. What else can we do? Let's actually modify some of the DOM. So let's go back to basics again. We're just going to put in a script tag and an alert. So if I click on this now, then just by, by adding that query string on the top now, I've injected a script, JavaScript, into the page, and I've got an alert. So it's annoying, yes, but again, no, no direct security vulnerability. But taking it one step further, what if we do uh, alert document.cookie? See any problems with that? Well, at the moment, it still has to happen on my machine. I have to click on it, and I'm shown my cookie. Nobody else sees the cookie. But what if we send the cookie to another site? So I'm logged in as admin at the moment. I'm just going to jump over into this private browser over here. And we'll go to good.cto.to. And we can see that we're not logged in. All right, let's ignore that for a second. So I'm back in my normal browser. And uh, I'm logged in as admin. And we run this script here, which creates an image, an in-memory image. It doesn't get displayed. So using JavaScript, we create an in-memory image. And that image has a source, which is the collection PHP script on the evil site, passing the document cookie through. So now if I log in, although I already am, I'm logged in. Uh, if we look over here now, we can see the session ID has been saved on evil.cto.to. So let's copy that, jump over into our private browser. So this is, in effect, somebody on a completely different machine. The cookies aren't shared between these two browsers. This could be somebody on the other side of the world. So over here, I'm just going to come in, and I'm going to say uh, document.cookie. No, not constructor. Uh, it's that one equals. We're going to add in the PHP sesh ID and paste that in. And now if I refresh this page, oh, what happened there? PHP the right way, PHP sesh ID. Ah, this is where the demos go wrong. Can anybody spot the error? Hmm? Did I misspell session? Uh, no, it's supposed to be PHP sesh ID. Ah, it was hidden because it's a responsive website. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so let me just do that again um, so that we can see what's going on. So I am actually logged out this time, and this is still a bri private browser. And I'm going to move the console to the bottom so we can see that at the top now. And then in here, I'm going to rerun that, and I'm going to refresh this page. No, it just doesn't like me, does it? Well, it was working, right? Got it working once. So there, therein lies the issue, is that the session ID has now been sent off to a third-party site that somebody can grab. And theoretically, just by adding it into their, um, their local browser, they've now uh, 
essentially captured your session, because the session IDs are exactly the same. It's like you're running in the same browser. So if I was um, logged in as Ben, and then I logged in, uh, as, uh, then my privileges were escalated to admin level, and I refreshed in the other browser because it's the same session, the, other, uh, the, the, the hacker would then have access to that admin level privilege as well. So the lesson here is, um, again, to do with user input sanitizing. Uh, obviously, there's no real reason why you would want to echo any kind of HTML directly into an HTML page without some kind of escaping. Again, most of your frameworks will probably take that into account, but understanding the premise is a, a valuable thing. So weak authentication and session management. I was working on a project a few years ago now, um, and I'm sad to say that it was 2016 or so, rather than 2002. It was 2002, I probably could have understood. Um, but this is almost line by line a copy of exactly how they did their Remember Me system. So we have on the right-hand side here um, information about the, uh, the cookie information and also the session information over here. At the moment, the cookie has just got the session ID in it. So they wanted a way for people to be able to log in and then close their browser and come back later and still be logged in. They said, that's fine. We're going to log them in. So we now see the user information here. We've got the username and password. We know their flag. So this is all on the server. There's no real security vulnerability here. We're just echoing it out. We can see the ID of the user is user number two. They said, okay, so what we'll do is we'll just, did I hit the remember me flag? We'll just add in a remember cookie and the user ID. So I expect this one to work. So this is, again, the, um, the private browser, uh, which I'm now logged in as. So I'll log me out, and I'll refresh. I'm logged out. I'll refresh again. Still logged out. OK, great. So now what I'm going to do is instead of, come here, instead of putting a PHP session ID in, I'm just going to say remember equals 2. And now I'm logged in as admin, because that's user ID 2. This is in a production application. So a better way of doing this, and something that they, they change rather quickly, um, is to, instead of having an ID, I forgot to tick the box again. Remember me. So instead of having an ID, have uh, a different kind of ID. So down here we have uh, a GUID. And if we jump over to my, if I can get that over there. Where's it gone? Here we go. So this is good.cto. Let's make that a bit bigger. Come on. Not having much, much luck typing today, am I? Use understanding. Right, so if I describe the users table now, or user table, um, we have in there a GUID. And if I select everything from there, we can see that the admin user has a GUID associated with it. So now what happens is, in order to have a remember me functionality to automatically log you in, not only do you need to know the GUID, but you can't actually read the GUID or infer the GUID from any system because it's generated dynamically at the time that the remember me button is ticked. So as an attacker, I need to be able to have direct access to the database in order to get the GUID out. And if I've got direct access to the database, as a systems administrator, I've got much bigger problems. So don't use cookies, essentially, for anything that pertains directly to user credentials. In the same way as you wouldn't store a password in a cookie, would you store a password in a cookie? Correct. <laughs> so in the same way as you wouldn't store a password in a cookie, you don't store IDs as they automatically log me in. I mean, that's even worse, right? because I can guess that from anywhere in the world. All right, let's move that away again. So let's take, um, oh, and then finally, the, the, just before we go on to the, the cross-site request forgeries, um, we're logged in at the moment, and indirect secure object reference is actually a really fairly simple uh, thing to implement. 
um, but it's about having access to secured documents. So you can write a web application so that the pages are secured and you've got access control lists within your application that will stop people getting to like the admin dashboard. But say, for example, you generate a PDF report and um, that's stored in slash report slash this month slash blah dot PDF. And in order to get to it, you log into the admin panel and you have to be an admin to get to the admin panel and then there's a link there for you to download it. And when you click on the download file, it goes access granted. Now, in most cases, because that's a PDF file, you'd have access even if you weren't logged in because the web server is not gonna be applying the ACLs that your web application is. So what this is doing is it's actually going through a download PHP script. So this could be, again, be in your language of your choice. And it's passing through a document ID, which means that if I log out, the application, the web application, can now do a check to say, is this person logged in and should I allow them access to this? And then the next level of best practice is the PDFs shouldn't even be in your document route. They should be stored outside of that, and then you use your proxy page, essentially, um, to pass through that information to the browser for downloading, rather than um, having direct file access. So that's essentially what the direct um, object reference is about. So we're going to do something a little bit different now. We're going to look at cross-site request forgery. So we're going to actively try and um, subvert a shopping system. So uh, this is a highly complex website. You can probably tell lots of hours went into the design and user experience of this. Um, I did lots of user studies. There's a shopping uh, product list on the left. Um, I want to buy myself a shiny laptop. Uh, I don't have an option for mad laptops. Uh, and a cordless keyboard. I'm going to put the cordless keyboard in there. And I want to get that shipped to my home address, so I'll just click set address. And then if I check out, uh, I'm told that I'm going to get my shiny laptop, my keyboard. I'm going to get it sent home, and the total amount that I just paid uh, was $2,100. Um, so let's try that again. Let's add a product in, and then uh, add the cordless uh, laptop, the keyboard in. I'm going to get that sent to home. But right now, before I hit submit, I've just got an alert from my favorite social media system saying there's an awesome photo I have to look at. Um, so I jump over to Visage. I don't know what that ref refers to. Um, and uh, we've got a picture here of a lovely dog. Um, and we've got over on the right-hand side some comments. So I need to log in if I want to, because I'm not logged in at the moment. So I need to log in if I want to add a comment. Um, but I can also click on it and get a closer picture. Isn't that a cute dog? I mean, who doesn't want to click on a photo of a cute dog? Um, so I go in and um, I put in my username, password, or whatever. But let's have a look at ways that we could actually subvert this, not by attacking good, the good website, but by attacking Visage. So um, we're now going to use a third-party system to attack the original system. So using similar um, cross-site attacks that we saw in example two, I can force it to do an alert, which basically is up here um, passing this through as the name value, so the, the attack we were doing before where we um, inject the name into the username field. Uh, and we're basically putting an alert in. Uh, but that's not very interesting, and it's, uh, again, quite disruptive. So let's have a look at a different... So I'll just reset that page. If we do an alert on click, now nothing has happened, so I'm not aware of the fact that the page is going to act any differently. Uh, what we've done is we've basically set a timeout. So the reason for the timeout here is that I want this JavaScript to run after the page is finished loading. Um, I don't want to rely on things like document being ready or any third-party plugins. So I'm just going to say, look, wait for about a second, by which time it's probably going to be fine, and then I can inject this, uh, run, run this JavaScript. And what I'm going to do is on the click of any an anchor tags, I'm going to alert one. So now if I click on the dog over here, I get the alert and the dog. Uh, so the third part of this is um, this exciting bit over here. So essentially what's going to happen is I'm using that set timeout again so I can um, add a click action to the anchor tag. But instead of doing an alert, I'm now going to create that in-memory image. And the source of that in-memory image is going to be a request to add the, the uh, shiny laptop to the cart in good.cto.to. I'm going to create a second image. And the source of that image is going to be to set the address to someone else's house. So now when I come across and I look at this dog and I go, oh my god, isn't that cute? But anyway, I want to complete my order. So I go to checkout, and suddenly I've ordered nine laptops. I've paid $1,800, assuming my credit card has actually got that amount of credit on it. Um, but it's all being shipped to somebody else's place. 
And that's without any kind of direct interaction or direct um, attack through my browser interface of the uh, shopping cart system. Scary? I hope so. So, uh, let me just find where we were up to. This one here. So there's the demo. So what are the solutions? I kind of discussed a few of them as we were going through the examples. Um, but I'll take them all through um, step by step and uh, go a bit more in depth into what's actually happening behind the scenes beyond just seeing the generated output. So the biggest solution for me uh, as a PHP developer, um, and I would probably say this goes the same for every, any language, was to um, think like your, like your language thinks. Think like, think like the interpreter or the compiler thinks. Um, put your brain into the situation. And I'm not saying think in the language, but actually think like it. So imagine that you are Nginx, or you are PHP, or you are the .NET framework, or you are and, and put a mental mo model in your mind of what's going on. Um, and if that's something you don't do on a day-to-day -day basis, perhaps practice. Because understanding what's happening behind the scenes at a, an application framework level is quite important. So in my case, I was thinking like PHP, and in any, any kind of web application scenario, you've got your client on the one side, and you've got your web server on the other side, and the traditional kind of conversation is, I want the home page, and the server says, here's a home page, and then it says, well, I also want the styles and the JavaScript and the logo because they're all in the HTML, so it sends all these requests at once, and then asynchronously, these three responses come back, and uh, the, the client can then render the web page. So what happens when you add any kind of programming language uh, framework or anything into the back end. It's basically a layer behind the web server. So what happens is a request comes in for the index.php script, uh, which starts a PHP process, quite generically, run this script. And then something comes back and says, well, I want to do login, so it starts a PHP process, just some kind of script. Uh, so these PHP processes are quite unintelligent. They're basically taking data from the web server, which is kind of the intermediary point between the client and the application, and it's doing something and then it's spewing out information. It might also do some kind of processing in the background. Um, but essentially, it's just data in, data out. Um, because we're within the same browser here, we've got evil and good on the same site. So the, the cross-site request forgeries will usually happen well when you've got two applications open in the same browser. Um, the reason for that is that when you're on tab one there at evil.com, any requests to good.com from that tab will actually send through, because the browser will do so automatically, the cookies for good.com. This is actually a good thing in a way. This is how analytics tracking works. That may not be a good thing. But that, that's, that, that's the way analytics tracking works. So uh, when, whenever evil.com's website makes a request um, through like JavaScript attacks or whatever to good.com, good.com's uh, cookie is sent to the server. Therefore, PHP's processes don't actually know necessarily where it came from. I'll touch on um, referrer headers later, but don't rely on them. So we've got a point here where at the top we got the address edit from the evil website. Now at this point here, nothing's happened, so it actually returns a 401, you're not authorized, don't know who you are. So you could actually have a system uh, on, uh, on, uh, on evil.com polling for 401s, and as soon as it doesn't get a 401, then it can complete the process, because further down there we've got edit system again, and it comes back with a 200 OK. I've received your request, we know you're logged in, and your shipping information for the current cart has now been set to whatever you've just provided to me. PHP is dumb. So like I say, it ain't clever. Data comes in, data goes out, and it could be in multiple different kind of formats. Um, the other thing to be aware of in any kind of framework uh, application language is the way the data is created. The data that you're receiving into your language, there's this whole um, mantra of don't trust any data that comes in. Like if it's from an absolutely known trusted source, then okay. But if it's user generated data, absolutely don't trust it. And I, and I would uh, echo that as well. But one of the issues is um, some frameworks will actually give you access to data without you knowing what the source of that data is. And that's an even bigger problem. So PHP, for example, has uh, a couple of different global variables that are available for get, post, and cookie information. So every time a request comes in from, uh, through the, the web server, these three arrays are filled with information depending on what kind of request came through. That's useful. It also has a request 
array, which is basically the amalgamation of all those bits of data. So if you're addressing user-generated data from the request array, you don't actually know where it came from. So if you think there's a PHP session ID in the request array, you'll be right, because it came from the cookie. But if somebody then posts one through via the post array as well, then perhaps there's a way of overriding it. Or even worse, just through the get query string, which you could do with a simple curl command line. So piecing data together is tricky, and understanding where your sources are from is important. Um, so in this case, for this example, there was no consistency in terms of where the data came from. Uh, you shouldn't use them. Specify the source, the absolute source that you know where you want the information to come from. Uh, and again, do your own validation against it. Um, don't, don't trust the data that comes through and consider all data harmful. Validate all incoming data. Uh, you wouldn't arrive in a new country and not have your passport checked. Um, although there have been some countries I've entered where it's almost been a cursory glance. So maybe they need to check on their data validation processes. Um, but validate all incoming data. Um, something a bit topical to Australia at the moment is uh, looking out for odd entry points. Can anybody spot the odd entry point here? We've got all these planes flying around. And just over on the top right-hand corner, we've got a boat trying to get in. Because we have to stop the boats. It's very important. So look out for our data entry points. Again, if you're um, looking at certain arrays of information that are coming through, make sure you know where the data originated from. And if it looks like it's, um, like you could use, for example, the referrer headers to say, well, does it look like it's coming from the wrong place? But again, don't trust those implicitly. So this is an actual attack I've seen on a gallery application, a fairly large common gallery application, where the, um, underneath the image, when it shows all the thumbnails, it shows you the original file name of the image that was uploaded. Anybody guess what happens when you upload a file name of quote greater than less than script greater than alert A? So using file names as, like, file names are basically user-generated data. When you upload a file, that's something you can change. So don't trust that. When you're putting information into your databases, assume that that is uh, a hackable entry point. Can anybody tell me what a valid email address looks like? Does, does that look valid? How about that one? Yeah. Although some providers won't accept it, which is really annoying. How about that one? How about that one? They're all valid. Um, so, of course, what you do is you implement some kind of email address validation. <laughs> no? Are you sure? I mean, it's, it's quite straightforward, self-explanatory. I mean, you could debug that, couldn't you? What about this? Is that a good email validation solution? Yes, no, yes? No? Got no idea? Uh, essentially, when we're validating email addresses, what are we trying to do? We want to check that the syntax is valid, and we want to check that the email address is owned by the person who's giving it to us. And what's the best way of doing that? Send them an email. If the email address is invalid, it won't get through. And if it does and they respond to it, then it's their email address. So don't bother about validating email addresses. I mean, you could go back to this as a pr pr preliminary check, just to make sure. You could even say, is there a at least one character followed by an at, and then at least one character, a dot, and at least two characters, or something like that. Whatever it is you want to do, just to weed out the obvious, I haven't read what this is, and I'll put my first name in kind of errors. Names. How many people here think they understand exactly what every name looks like? We had a comment earlier about somebody who had a single letter surname. Um, there's a whole falsehood list here, like goes at least 40 long, um, ben.sc slash name falsehoods, if you want to have a look at the full list. Uh, I'll be sharing these slides as well with you. Um, but like, who decides whether a name is valid? There are so many systems out there that will tell you, and Facebook's one of them. I don't know whether they still do, but I still remember um, only about five, six years ago um, trying to put in a name, and they said, this doesn't look valid. I'm like, well, who are you to tell me that it's not valid? So Jose Smith, for example, is a valid name, but some systems might have character encoding issues with it. Does your system do that? Layamon has extended 
further extended characters that are further outside of the scope of normal character sets. Thorin Aikenskaldi. A couple of extra characters in here. Um, it's getting a little bit long. Is that going to fit into your database? Pelea do Achilios, I believe, is the pronunciation. I'm very happy to be corrected on that. Uh, will your database accept that as a name? What about Frederico del Salgado Carazón de Jesús García Lorca? Will that fit into your maximum string length? I think on Wikipedia that was like the longest valid name thing that they had. So don't validate names. Don't tell people whether or not their name is right or wrong. Don't require a first and last. Just have a name field. And then once you've got your data in, how are you going to sanitize it? A lot of systems that you've got will probably take user-generated content and sanitize it and then stick it into a database of some sort. That kind of makes sense, right? Because then you can use that data in a safe way when you output it to your web page. I would suggest that doing it the other way around would probably be a better option, because if you're storing the data exactly as the user provided in your database, you've got a couple of advantages. The first one is that you can reprocess that data at any time in the future if you want to change the way you sanitize. If you've realized that there's something you've done wrong, you've got the source data to work with. You could also potentially use it for some kind of analysis to see, is anybody trying to break my system? Um, but more importantly, you can actually take your sanitization function, you can re-implement it differently for different outputs. You might want to have HTML in the first instance and then output it to email in the next instance, or perhaps uh, output it as some kind of exportable data form or whatever else you might do in the future. You don't know now how you'll need the data, so store it exactly as you got it and process it as you need it. Cross-site request forgeries. How do we block those? Um, so again, a lot of frameworks will handle this for you, but essentially um, we have tokens that are generated and stored in the back end, and we generate a token and we stick it into a hidden field in the form, which then gets submitted back through the form submission process, checked off against the list of tokens, and all is okay. Which means if a third party system is trying to hit your site, they're not gonna have that token, and they're not gonna be able to get accepted by your system. Uh, like I said, don't trust, refer don't trust uh, referrers. They can actually be forged as easily as just the core string, core request down at the bottom there. Uh, and consider unusual attack vectors. It's a bit of a blurry photo, but there is actually a boom gate in the middle there to stop people getting through. How many people here work in a startup? <laughs> How many people have heard this? So this happens quite frequently, and it's understandable. You've got an MVP, you want to get it launched as quickly as possible. Just make it live, let's see what happens. Let's test it. Uh, we always test live as well. Um, but things can go wrong. You might have a perfect security system that you haven't actually test all the attack vectors. So I hope that's given you a bit of an insight into the type of security attacks that can happen. Um, what happens when you don't rely on frameworks and, um, and to, uh, libraries and toolkits to take this off your hands. Uh, understanding it, even if you have processes to look after this for you, I think is a really important part of um, being a, a strong and informed software engineer. Um, there's a list of all these references here. You'll notice the top one there is actually a hyperlink, so if you'd all like to come up and click on the board um, to get that URL. Uh, the other option is you can go to ben.sc slash scaleconf19 dash slides to download this exact slide pack and click on it in there. Um, but I also have to thank like the photos that I've used and the, the list and stuff. So I hope that's been insightful. I'm happy for questions. I don't know how we're doing for time on that front. Um, but thank you for your time. Cool. Thanks, Ian. Any questions? Yep, down the front. Um, something to add to the, uh, the header token. Um, also do the inverse. Uh, inspect the headers, especially if you've got pass-through systems that, pass, that, that proxy requests. Inspect what is in your header so that people don't just inject properties into your property bag and then you're not aware of it. Scrape everything out of there that shouldn't be in there. That's a good point. So scraping information that you're not expecting out of the headers and the data payloads and all the rest of it. Um, so would that, that, that would essentially be like the sanitization before you store. 
So you're arguing for sanitizing before and after? Okay, that's a fair point. So the follow-up to that was just make sure that anything goes through or into your system uh, is exactly in the format that you're expecting and, and you're not storing anything you shouldn't be. Right at the back. Yeah, quick question about that sanitization as output as opposed to as input. Doesn't that kind of circumvent the point of sanitization in the first place? If you're saving something to your database and you haven't sanitized it and you want to sanitize it afterwards, it yes, might be good corrupt point. data. So the sanitization I see different as... Um, uh, different to uh, escaping. So sanitization is making sure that the data is exactly what you want to output. If you're processing SQL based on input, then absolutely you need to make sure that you're not passing, you're not allowing injection into the SQL or whatever other kind of data store you're storing into. Yep. All right. So um, if you have, for example, a affiliate who's using your site in an iframe, how would you protect against cross-origin attacks in that case if the affiliate needs to change code on their side to work with your site. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm finding there's a buzz all of a sudden. I'm finding it very hard to hear you. Okay, now. Sarah, is there a technical person in the room? Yeah, they're, they're trying to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? No. <laughs> he, he's, he's, turning, he's turning it off and on again, and that he seems is, yeah. to have fixed it. There we go. Try again. Cool. Um, so let's say with regards to cross-origin attacks, yep. if you have, for example, an affiliate who's loading your site through an iframe, how would you protect your site against cross-origin attacks from there when you can't control um, the data they're sending and the origin it's coming from? So if it's in, so the iframe is your site and they're embedding your site within theirs, is that what you're saying? No, um, they're embedding your site into their pages. Yeah, okay, so their site.com has your site.com as the content of an iframe. So um, they can't inject into you directly into your iframe um, based on the, the principles of the most recent browsers anyway. If somebody's running a really old browser, you've got bigger problems. Um, so within that context, uh, I mean, the difference between that and having the application open in two tabs is no different. So the risk that you're looking at there is if, you're, if you don't have uh, your site open in another tab, and they do, so the attack vector would be, I assume you're saying, the iframe is perhaps invisible, and they're loading up purely for the purposes of ensuring that a session exists that they can hijack. I've, I've got a question. Yes. Um, I'm allowed. Um, how, given a, a scope of, uh, of a, like a development cycle of, of four weeks or whatever, what percentage of time do you think should be given over to looking at security as part of a development cycle? Because it often feels like it's tacked on as a response rather yes. than it's something that's pro. Yes. Um, so there's a couple of different perspectives on that. Um, I think that every line of code we write should be with a security lens on it. Um, I don't think we should have to do security audits all the way through. Um, but when we're coding, have these principles in mind. Think about how your code is actually going to get interpreted. Think about attack vectors of where the data can come from. Um, make sure you're sanitizing the right points. These are all things that should be part of the normal development process. It's not a security component of development. I think that should just be part of development. Uh, in terms of adding extra on top of that, in terms of doing security audits, um, depending on the size of your team and, and how much um, of a risk factor there is and, and what your risk model is overlaying that, um, you might want to get a dedicated team involved in that, um, make it part of the peer review process as well. So it's nuanced. There's, there's a lot of, there's no right answer. Um, but more than currently, I think, would probably be a good idea for just for everybody. Like, even if you're the best security company in the world, it's more than you're currently doing, it'll probably be good. <laughs> uh, how effective have you found? Sorry, just, just before that, the, to the gentleman in the back that we were talking, can you come down and speak to me afterwards? I think it's an interesting conversation, but it's probably longer than we've got time for in the Q&A. Thanks. Yes. Uh, how effective have you found static analysis tools for not only identifying security problems, but making sure that your code base stays secure, that you don't end up with regressions? Because security reviews are great, and they can identify problems, but only at a point in time. 
Look, they're effective. There's no doubt about that. I would definitely recommend Im implementing them, using them, um, but I wouldn't rely on them solely. So I think multi-factored approach is always a good idea. Um, having people physically, personally reviewing the code, um, again, not necessarily 100% part of the peer review process is good. Putting tools in, automated tools to find um, potential uh, vulnerabilities through regression and the rest of it is, is a great idea as well. I would not advocate against it. Yeah. Hi. Um, and if we overlaid uh, security in a microservice environment, um, you were saying sort of secure into your data entry points. What about uh, putting security everywhere, uh, having it at every layer? in a microservice environment. Have you, what so, are your thoughts on that? Uh, security everywhere. So are you talking about like a um, SOA environment where you, you essentially don't trust anything? Yeah. So that's like the zero trust model where every unit of, um, of logic or every service uh, assumes that it's in a hostile environment. I think especially nowadays where we're moving a lot more towards cloud uh, and any kind of environment where there's lots of different systems, it's definitely the way to go. Like We used to live in a world where everything was um, walled, firewalled from the outside, and that very much applied to corporate environments where you've got full control, and hopefully nobody ever gets in. But if they do, then you're buggered. Um, but the, the way that um, hosting, provisioning, all of that is happening nowadays, it's no longer a valid perspective. I would actually argue that we shouldn't do um, perimeter uh, security Maybe at all, but probably a little bit, um, but the, the most of the concentration should be on the per service, definitely. And also within your system, um, even if you control the whole of your internal infrastructure uh, and, and you're doing HTTP-based requests, always over a TLS. So even if you trust your entire network internally, just transmit everything internally over HTTPS. Because again, if one person gets in, you've got a person in the middle attack vulnerability possibility there, because you're transmitting between internal systems insecurely. Great. What the back? Is there one more? Yeah. Do you want to run all the way back? <laughs> if you could then, if we could have a question from right over here afterwards, that would be great. <laughs> okay. Hey, that, that question, then this question, then we'll take a break. Hello. Hi. You said everything over TLS, but if you are on a host and two processes are connecting to each other using the loopback address, um, it's more efficient to use HTTP, or do you recommend still doing TLS there as well? So there is an argument that over TLS is going to be slightly, it's going to add overhead, because you've got to do the encryption, the handshaking, all the rest of it. Um, I personally would still be more comfortable doing it over TLS for the slight performance hit you get, because if that one host gets compromised, again, you've still got the ability to kind of jump into that loopback. So the, the risk uh, profile on that is a lot smaller. So if, and it, this has to be a decision you make as, as an organization rather than policy from some guy on stage. But if, you're, if you believe the risk factor is small enough that if somebody did manage to do that and there was a 0.001% chance of happening and the cost to your business was blur and that was something you're happy to wear, then sure, if that performance saving is going to help you out, go for it. I wouldn't be comfortable with that, though, but that, I'm, I'm overly paranoid. <laughs> um, you, so you mentioned earlier on about securing each individual service yep. um, in a microservices environment. Now, I have noticed, and this could be a uniquely South African problem <laughs> that we do, is that we are very good about authentication, but once you're in, like you have everything. Like right. we just do not do authorization anywhere. The database, maybe, if you're lucky, you might get admin and you might get the rest, but that's about it. Like the database gets authorization, everything else is you either have access to the API or you ain't got it. If you've got the API, <laughs> you got everything. Like, and then people say, okay, the, the answer is go and do OAuth and pass tokens around, but then any given microservice team, it's not going to go and do OAuth for the whole organization because they got a deadline and they're on some kind of scrum thing and they're trying to deliver in two weeks' time. So then nobody does authorization. Like, do you have any suggestions? Is there anything that's easy out there that's just like 
slap on some authorization, like a UI. <laughs> so I, I believe it was Wayne this morning said there's a guy called Ben in the room who works for Auth0, and you should talk to him about doing all of your security stuff so that you can concentrate on working on the business solution you're trying to create. Um, but I'm not supposed to spruik my own business up here, so I won't go there. But if you want to have a chat afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> How much was that? That was a good, good segue.